they're shoved into this survival situation where they have to run from the cops. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't give it away, bro. Wait, don't do not do it, Don't man. give it away. You, you want me yo. to stop? Real Talk with Star Scorpio, Season 7. So I was introduced to my, my guest here from... From another guest I had on the show, Kevin Touch, entrepreneur, young, smart gentleman. And um, when I connected with Zach, I was immediately attracted to his energy. I was like, yo, this guy is a cool cat. And then I come to find out he's uh, publishing a book called Death Craver. So today we're going to talk about that, his experience, and uh, we're going to get into a lot. So, Zach, welcome to Real Talk with Star Scorpio. How you doing today? Good, man. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. Good, good. Thanks for coming out, bro. And, um, you know, with Real Talk, we like to build a timeline. So first, we're going to start off. Where were you born and raised? Uh, so I was born in Wareham, Massachusetts. And then I was raised a couple towns over in Mattapoisett, um, where I spent pretty much most of my life, a little bit of time, uh, in a city to the west of New Bedford. And then I've been a little bit all over the place. That's like a quick timeline all the way up to now. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was pretty much Matt Poison growing up. Okay. Bro, let's just tell the people what I did. Like, so before I started recording, I asked uh, Zach um, where he's from uh, right now, where he is right now. And he said, Massachusetts. And I said, oh, you live in Boston. <laughs> Jeez, man. And what'd you tell me? What do people think every time you say Massachusetts? It's always Boston, man. Everyone always says it's Boston. It's not just Boston, man. They might as well just change the state name to Boston. <laughs> That's all everyone ever says. Is, oh, you live in Boston. Right? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I made that mistake. And then I realized, yeah, I'm a Toronto kid. But um, yeah, so young, your early years, man. Do you have any siblings? Um, not when I was growing up. I mm -hmm. do now. Um, I have a seven-year-old sister now. Mm -hmm. So same dad. Um, growing up, it was pretty much just me. And then uh, when my mother uh, married again around, I was 2000, 2009. So I was 11 and a half. Mm -hmm. And so I got a couple step-siblings. So I would see... Um, one of my stepsisters a lot whenever she had her weekends with my stepfather. Yeah. Um, but I never really saw the other two. They were older, so they were moving on, doing their own thing, you know, living life. Okay. So, yeah, Yo, that's so, pretty much it. So then let the people know your age. So I know what um, era I'm dealing with here when I'm talking to you. I'm 26, just turned 26 uh, yesterday. Oh. So yesterday being May 19th. Yo, happy belated. I think you were telling me that, bro. So happy belated, man. Or belated yeah, happy man. birthday. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yo, when you you have your license, right? Hell yeah. When you <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I gotta get into something too, because I, I heard you like like cars and racing and stuff like that too, and like watching. But uh we'll get into that a little later. But is is the states like Canada where when you turn twenty five your insurance drops drastically? Um, here it's basically six years. Okay. So once you get six years, you're like on the good premium and stuff, which I'm sadly not on now. Uh, Massachusetts <laughs> has this safe drivers program. So every time you cause an accident, you get points on it, which mm. is a bad thing. You don't want points. You want zero. You want so, zero. Yeah. Um, I got like five points right now and my insurance went up like, uh, I want to say it was like 30% or something. Oh, Zach, wait, what are you doing, bro? What are you doing? <laughs> uh, I, I caused an accident. It was completely my fault, my mistake, you know. Um, but so now I'm stuck with like a raised premium for like the next six years. Oh, wow. Like, are you okay yeah. for an accident and the other person? Oh, yeah, it was a uh, slow speed accident. But yo, don't you, when sometimes when you get in accidents, I've been in accidents too. Do you was it bad where there was damage though? Because some people say, "Ah, we'll deal with it because we know what's going to happen. Like insurance will go up." But do you have that conversation? Yeah, the the damage needed to be repaired, uh -huh. and they just you know they just repair everything. Um, from my car, it was um, from the right front fender. 
Um, the right, the passenger side side window was a little scuffed. There mm -hmm. was apparently some damage on the passenger door that I didn't, I couldn't really see. Mm -hmm. They replaced the rim, um, and then like it was like all the the headlight display, and it all comes as one piece, so they have to replace the whole thing. Well, of course, yeah. So you know. It was like seven thousand dollars of damage. Thankfully, I didn't have to pay all of that. Yeah, but um, I don't know what the other guy did. His door was completely like dented in. Mm -hmm. He had an older vehicle, so he might have just gotten in a new truck. For all I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, sorry to hear that, man. But you know, as time goes on, your insurance will come down if you're yeah, safe, and, Zach. If you're safe. <laughs> yeah, it was my first cause, so I should okay. be fine. Okay, cool, man. Now, let, let's talk about school because, you know, we have the public school. Well, I don't know if it's the same. I can't remember what it is in um, the States, but we have public school, junior high school, and then high school. But I believe that you're like a blank slate. You know, you have an interest when you're, when you're a child, you know, you have your home interests and stuff. But I believe you're a blank slate. And then when you go to school, you start to understand what you're interested in and what you're good at. What were you good at in school when it comes to like subjects? Um, math and English were my top two for sure. Yeah. Um, I remember, uh, in early grade school, you'd have spelling tests. And I remember my fifth grade year, I got a hundred on every spelling test. So I was like really proud of that. Like that yeah. was like my, my peak English vocabulary right there was fifth grade. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in high school, I was really good in English and math too, except at the end when we got into pre-calculus then my like my my like uh, knowledge of math just dropped out the window oh. <laughs> i didn't really understand like i don't know if it yeah. was the teacher or me or what it's the teacher it's the teacher bro it was the last four months of senior year so you kind of stop caring when you don't need to pass the class to graduate so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i remember when you know when you're in, we call it we had oacs Right. After you finish your, I can't remember how many credits. I think it's 30 credits. You have to get six OACs. And I forgot what OEC stand for, Ontario or something. But um, that's when there was the calculus, algebra, and a course called finite too. And for the sciences, oh my gosh, chemistry. I'm like, did you, so what about science? Science, I was really good at. We didn't have to take, uh, for my graduating class, we only had to take two years. So we only had to take biology and chemistry. Okay. Um, but I did um, forensic science my junior year. That was really fun. Oh, you had that. Oh, wow. Yeah. That mm -hmm. was like a elective full year class. So we got to do that. So uh, back to your initial question about like how the school's structured and stuff. So it was elementary, middle school, um, junior high was seventh and eighth grade. And then so we had high school nine to 12. Mm -hmm. So I was actually under a, what's called like an IEP program. So it's like... Um, like kind of kids that just have like some minor disabilities of learning, mm -hmm. learning disabilities, or some are more like higher, like, um, you know, like kids with autism and uh -huh. other disabilities and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I had one. So I was actually out of the public school system for uh, my grade years from second grade to sixth grade. I had a lot of anger management issues. Oh, really? At least. Yeah. Yeah. Not fun times for me, man. Not fun times. But, you know, you live and you learn and it gets better. It's gotten better over time for me. Mm -hmm. um, but so I was reintroduced back into public school in seventh grade. So that was a real um, learning curve. Mm -hmm. And I like seventh grade was like pretty tough. Like I almost got expelled because I was still kind of off the wall. But yeah. by eighth grade, I kind of like learned how I needed to act from like, you know, watching other students and stuff. And then high school was, high school was pretty okay. Did, so did you have a mentor or anyone to talk to in counseling to help yeah. you with that? Yeah, yeah. So we had, we had guidance counselors that were designated to us. Mm -hmm. And then we also had, um, these learning rooms that were like help rooms that had like three or four teachers in them. Mm -hmm. um, I believe we called it LSC. It was like learning services, something like that. They yeah. had a, they had a name for it. It's been eight, it's been eight years. So, you know, I just yeah. forget what they call it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I know the feeling. <laughs> but I actually got to the point where my senior year, you know, 
my birthday is like right at the end of the school year. Right. But I actually convinced um, my mother to sign me out of the program. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it was in April. So for like the last month, it might have been March. It was like the last month or two of my senior year. I was no longer in that program because I felt I didn't need to be. And my mother was like, sure, you, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to be in there. It's okay. And so, yeah, I I really think it's important to have that support system, man, and and not have people give up on you. You know what I mean? Uh, it's it's very important, especially as a young mind growing up, because it's so. When I look back at high school, I'm glad you shared this with me. I look at this. I look at some people that had trouble in school, and when when I meet when I'm talking about that, I mean academically, right? And so not the sports and the art, not those classes. And later on, a lot of people dropped out. And now when I think back at it, a lot of people probably had challenges that they couldn't talk about. They didn't want to share or talk to their friends about. And they became um, introverted. And then they would just drop out of school and start work early or something, you know? Yeah. And I was, I was pretty introverted. You know, I tried to be more outgoing, but I was very because of the early years being um small classrooms like i think um second to sixth grade the biggest classroom i might have had was like 15 kids oh, and it was wow. like second second grade and then the third grade to the sixth grade years those were all like 10 or less so i had a lot of social struggles you know like mm -hmm. um in my classes it was pretty much all all male classes i think my third gear year there was one girl and that was it like fourth grade fifth grade sixth grade there was like no girls so like learning how to like talk to a girl correctly was a real struggle socially mm -hmm. and i'd get very nervous yeah so like now like growing up 26 years old i'm so much more comfortable like i'm normal pretty much now like i've gotten used to talking to girls and all that stuff so but it was very challenging like social anxiety wise just oh, wow. like, i i would say that i would say dumb things i'd say like stupid things you know like i was yeah. all wrong about it like if i could go back and do it over like i'd ha i have all the knowledge now but yeah you know it's almost like you know yeah like you wouldn't really change it because you know now it's made me who i am wow zach this is interesting and when i get to um my would you rather question I want to hear how you answer that because um, the question has to do with kind of what you're talking about well, going back. But um, yeah, thanks for being so candid, open with this information. Did you have a tight circle of friends too, though? Or Yeah, so I had, if we look back to 7th grade to 10th grade, I had pretty much the same circle. It was about a dozen friends, you know. Everyone in my school, at least everyone usually sat with the same people. No one really went out of their circles. Mm -hmm. So I had a couple good friends. Um, this kid, Vinny, who also watched uh, racing with me, which, you know, we'll get into the racing, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of a lot of stuff I can talk about there. Yeah. Um, I had a friend, Peter, oh. just like you. <laughs> <laughs> um and then I had a friend from my first grade year, uh, Ryan. So, mm -hmm. which I don't really talk to any of those guys anymore. We kind of all like went our separate ways after high school. But um, okay. 11th grade was a weird year where because of the sports filming I had been doing, I was growing closer to the uh, athletes in the school. Mm -hmm. So I started my 11th grade year, I started sitting um with like the jocks and stuff and that's when it was like looking back now it's like i should never have really done that oh, okay. but i also it was also good that i did because it helped me learn that i was actually more awkward around them than i was around like my actual friends so it mm -hmm. was like it was a, 11th grade was a weird weird year yeah so tell me something before we started recording i asked you how tall you were and you said you're Six. six foot six foot two with like shoes on so in high school were you a late bloomer or how, how tall were you did you did you sprout up fast in the early years or in high school um 
I want to say sophomore year was the growth spurt year. I remember, I think I entered high school at about five foot four, five foot five, oh, wow. which I was tall for my grade. You know, oh, there was okay. someone, there were like one or two kids that were taller than me by a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then I want to say sophomore year, I shot up to like five ten, five eleven by the end of the year. And then it was just like slowly from there. Um Good. But I was skinny, man. I was skinny. I think <laughs> I graduated like six foot, one thirty or something like that. Oh, wow, wow. So, but this is what I want to ask. Did the reason I asked your height is did this play a role? Do you think too? Because I noticed a lot of taller guys were more confident. But sometimes, if you're awkward, it might not, you know, come natural. But did your height play a role in anything being shorter and then just sprouting up? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe mm-hmm. I wouldn't. I wouldn't really know. You know, I didn't really pay attention to to the height that way. I guess. Okay, but when you um were recording basketball games, so you were around those tall guys. Were they tall? The most of the basketball team. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Most of them were tall. There were a couple guys shorter, but I'd say most players were at least five foot seven. I think. Oh, five foot seven. Maybe five uh- foot eight. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, not not any shorter than that. No. Not shorter than that. But um, so what did you do for the team? Let the people know. You recorded the games for them every time? Yeah, so I was, to backtrack a little bit on the basketball. So my freshman year, I had been looking into doing sports stuff. I was curious to do, like, broadcasting stuff at the time. Mm-hmm. And so... My freshman year, I got hooked up with uh, the basketball coach who also commentated the football games for varsity. Okay. So he was their commentator, just like, you know, number 85 tackled, number 21 or whatever. Yeah. So I would spot for him, which wasn't really the best job for me because I couldn't really, even with the binoculars, I couldn't really see too well. Mm -hmm. But I made it work and I did all the home games. And then that turned into an opportunity to film the varsity games for him Mm because he was the coach for varsity. So I did that freshman year, sophomore year. And then going into junior year, they started to want, they asked me if I wanted to film uh, for the soccer team for varsity. So then I was recording for varsity soccer and I started doing some road games and stuff too. I'd ride on the buses and I'd go do the road games. Um, so I think my junior year for basketball, I did most of the games, um, soccer, same thing. The thing with soccer was funny though, is, um, the camera was almost always dead for the soccer team. Yeah. So I never really did the soccer games. Yeah. I was just kind of there watching Mm -hmm. almost like, like a supporter or whatever. Okay. But it was still cool to get to go to all the games and stuff. And then. Senior year, I did a little bit. We did a little recording for soccer, but mostly I was just going to the games with the team. Mm -hmm. And um, senior year, the coach for basketball actually wanted to put the recording back in the hands of the freshman players. So he had had them doing that again, Mm -hmm. which was perfectly fine for me because uh, senior year, the team ended up going all the way to states and they won the state championship. (laughs) So I got to actually, uh, like, scream and yell my head off as a fan because yeah, yeah. that was one thing that the coach would give me some some harp on sometimes is he's like, oh, like, I want to upload the games for people to watch. And he, he wouldn't really edit them or anything, but he's like, I don't really want you, like, saying stuff or whatever. Like, I don't know. Like, we had a couple instances <laughs> where um, I would say stuff if something was going on on the court. Yeah. Um, I remember there was one road game – I think it was my sophomore year that there was almost a fight on the court between one of our players and the opponent. Yeah. And I remember it being as the fault of the opponent, like the opponent player, you know, had a bad attitude or something. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I I don't remember what my exact words were. I wasn't swearing or anything, but I was like, you said something, I was saying some (laughs) stuff and the coach is like, he pulled me aside, like, I think the weekend after, and he was like, hey, man, I couldn't upload that game because of what you were saying. And I was yeah. like, oh, my bad. <laughs> where where did they upload it to? Um, I don't remember the site he had, but he had some kind of site that he would use, 
and he would just like put all the clips together and upload it raw. So it was just the raw clips. Yeah, no editing. Yeah. So do you do you edit too? You do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't edit for him at all, but yeah, I I could have learned probably back then, but I know now. So okay. So now, when did your love for racing start? Um, so the earliest memory I've got is when I was three or four years old. For my mm -hmm. birthday, I was given like a die cast car, like, mm -hmm. you know, the small die cast scale cars. It I was a that. number 88 quality care Ford driven by Dale Jarrett. You probably have no idea who that is, but if someone's out there that knows racing, they're like, oh, yeah, like they know that car. It was um, it was like blue with like red orange numbers. Mm hmm. So that was like, as far as I remember, that was how I got into it. And then I would, I would watch it on, uh, on TV and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like after that, I was hooked. Like, I don't know. I just, I saw it and I was hooked right away. Yeah. So I, I just, I would watch it all the time. It was on TV, just NASCAR. I was never really into, uh, indie car okay. too much growing up. Um, but we had this thing called speed channel back in the day. Mm -hmm. Rest in peace, speed channel. It's gone now, eh? <laughs> yeah, it's gone now. Um, Fox, Fox bought it, and they made it Fox Sports One. So, oh, okay, okay. Um, I think that's how it happened. Maybe they just, I mean, it might have just died out. But so anyway, so Speed Channel used to have a uh, Monster Jam on all the time. Yeah, they had motocross, Supercross. They had Rally Cross on. So I loved watching that stuff. I loved watching that stuff, but, um, and then they would have formula one on sometimes and I'd watch that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then they also had like the moto GP stuff. So I like had no idea who any of those drivers were, but I would just love watching it because it was, it was different than NASCAR. So I'd love it whenever it was on. Cause it wasn't, I was never usually like awake to watch it. Yeah. Did it make you want to race? Oh yeah, I definitely did. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, we didn't have the the finances, you know, family wise or the knowledge, my parents didn't have the knowledge of like who, who could get me a ride to race. And yeah. I've actually learned like later now that I kind of have motion sickness, so I can't really do it. Oh, really? Yeah. That's why I like doing the video game simulation racing, you know, cause there's no G forces involved and mm -hmm. I don't get motion sickness from that. How did you find out? About the motion sickness? Yeah. Yeah. Roller coasters. Oh my God. What happened? Do you have any story about that or roller coasters? Yeah, I mean, I would always get a little nauseous on certain ones. Mm -hmm. Um, and the the big thing that I would find out is if I was like I had like a Game Boy Advance and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Growing up, um, if I would play that in the car, I would I would get sick. Like I don't remember if it was because I would like look up a lot. Okay. But like I would start getting like motion sickness from that. Oh wow, man. So mm. um go back to Monster Jam. So have you ever been to a Monster Jam's crazy, man. Have you ever been to a live? Yeah, so we went I don't remember the year, but it was probably around I was ten or eleven maybe. Um mm. they had it at the Providence Center, one state over in Rhode Island. Okay. And it was it was small. It was like smaller than like the usual places they would go to, but it was still cool to see. So and loud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very loud. Yo, okay. Now I heard you're an avid reader, so you like reading. I want to ask you a question in a minute about John Grisham. So I know you read a couple of John Grisham novels, but um did you have any aspirations or dreams? Did you know what you wanted to do? Because you're still young. You're 26. But do you have um, any idea of what you want to do for your future where you make that coin? Yeah, I mean, it would be nice to get the books out there just to as many people as I can to read them and enjoy it. Um, I feel like I got a, a pretty good story so far through the first one and I'm going to make sure my OCD and perfectionism will make sure that the rest <laughs> of the story, there's no holes, no like plot holes and that it's, you know, you know, a good story, something I would enjoy going back to read. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's tough as like self-publisher, like you have to do it all yourself. So, yeah. Um, 
yeah, like it'd be nice. It'd be nice if it got out there, but I'm not really holding my breath on it or anything. Like I'm just kind of doing it for fun right now. And if I make some coin out of it, then, you know, that, that'd be nice. That's good. But I always have a plan too, man. I always have a plan and uh, get that out of the universe, man. Because, you know, we met for a reason. I still believe these things happen for a reason, man. And now we're going to talk about Death Craver in a minute. But now, John Grisham. So what's your favorite John Grisham uh, novel? And I want to know, was TV a big influence on your life first? Let me know if TV was a big influence on your life. Like yeah, the movies. Yeah, TV, TV and movies, yeah, definitely were a big influence. Um, I know I think it's a later question, but so my, my first love for cinema was star wars yeah i was, I was gonna ask you that <laughs> star yeah. wars was the first one so they had the um the prequel trilogy you know it came out mm -hmm. while i was growing up so i don't remember when phantom menace came out in 99 or when attack of the clones really came out in 2002 but um 2005 you know was revenge of the sith and mm -hmm. I was pretty much hooked. Like, I think that was the year I was hooked because I remember the earliest memory I have is we already had a DVD set of the original trilogy, like yeah. the remasters. And we had the, the prequel trilogies, like one, two, three and single, single DVDs, and, you know, DVDs back then had all the special features, you know, yeah, nowadays know. it's just, you get a DVD, <laughs> it's just a movie. You want the special features, you got to get the 4k disc, you know? yeah so yeah star wars was definitely the first one um cinema wise and then uh there was also these like tv show movies called um hot wheels movies there okay. was hot wheels highway 35 world race which came mm -hmm. out in 03 and then there were four sequel tv movies that came out um in 05 and 06 which were hot wheels accelerators so they had four movies and those were like racing on like uh, in other dimensions and uh, racing realms as they would call them in the show. So mm -hmm. those were the two ones I'd say those were like my main like movie inspirations growing up. Yeah. And then in my teenage years, I really loved Falling Skies that was on TNT. Mm -hmm. It was like an alien invasion type show. So... I was going to ask that you about one, that. That one's the, really good. You're, you're, you seem like the sci-fi guy, right? And yeah. um, I guess that's where your interests lie. Were you like a Trekkie too? So Star Trek too? Yeah, I like Star Trek a little bit when they made the newer movies and they came out. Yeah. Um, I was also big into the comic book heroes. So mm -hmm. I like I like Spider-Man, the first three Spider-Mans with Tobey Maguire when they came out. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And then once Iron Man came out, like I think I got hooked for Iron Man. Mm -hmm. um, so, so John Grisham, yeah, I actually, I actually <laughs> kind of need to look up because I don't want to say the wrong book here. Yo, I have the list. I have the list. I want to know. You know what I want to know? Yeah, you can pull up what you need to pull up. But you know, he did the firm <laughs> Pelican Brief, the the client, a time yeah. to kill. But um, I want to know from you because you like reading, right? Mm -hmm. And then you like movies. What's better to you? I remember we used to ask this question when we were young. Is it reading the book or watching the movie? I think I think it depends what you consume first. Mm -hmm. Like from my point of view, I think it depends what you consume first. Harry Potter, I was big. Harry Potter was another one I was big on. That's kind of more fantasy, right? Yeah. I watched all those movies. And then I remember... I, th my mother told me like, oh yeah, you read the book. And like, I don't remember reading some of them, but mm -hmm. I know I read, I read the sixth book in the seventh book. And I remember when I watched the movies, I didn't really care for the movies as much because I had read the books. Okay. Yeah. But the first five Harry Potter movies, I enjoyed the movies more than reading them. Mm -hmm. Um, And then... On the flip side of that, um, trying to think, I had another one in my head and now I forgot about it. Yeah. Um, 
recently I just watched a movie called Annihilation. Okay. That's um that's a book by Jeff Vandermeer, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that's the author. Um, so I watched the movie and I knew it was a movie based on a novel. Mm -hmm. And then I went and I read the plot summary for the novel and it's totally different from what it's... they did in the movie. Okay. And it yeah. sounds, it sounds interesting because the, the, it's a trilogy, you know, mm -hmm. like it's a trilogy series, but it's, it's interesting how far from the novel they took the movie. Yeah. And so, I, yeah, I think it's all about what you consume first. A lot of people do say the books are better though. Cause you know, the movie you have to condense to a right. certain time. Right. But what I want to know too, though, is I rem I don't know what book it was, but you can just say any book. I always, cause I, I don't read a lot. I never read as a kid like that. You know, I read a handful of books, but when we used to talk about this too, they all, people always said the book is more descriptive, like, if you're reading a horror book or like one of those suspense, it's gruesome. And then I guess in movies, they got to tone certain things down, you know, back in the days. But when you watch a horror, there's some gruesome horrors out there. But do you oh, believe yeah. that to be true, though? Like the book is very descriptive and it takes your mind in different places, too. Yeah, I would say it all depends on the rating they're shooting for, you know. Mm -hmm. um, one example that I can think of is you know, movies are always rated R restricted, which, you know, there are rated R movies that are a little gory and horrorsome, but they're like right on the edge. Like they go as far as they can. Right. And then you have like, um, you have the TV shows now, like the boys. Mm -hmm. You ever watch the boys? No, I, have, I haven't seen it. All right. Well, so the boys is a comic series and they've made a TV show of it. Mm -hmm. on uh, amazon prime one of my favorite actors is in it uh carl urban okay he's an amazing dude um mm -hmm. and that show is so graphic like they they would not be able to i think designate it r because of how like graphic the the gore is and stuff oh wow yeah yeah so the tv shows they they're allowed you know the streaming ones they, they get away with a little more because then they just say like oh yeah it's 18 plus whatever you know mm -hmm. they go crazy well so speaking of gore and all that were you are you a walking dead fan uh no actually not oh really oh never got into it never got, it's it's a great storyline man great storyline I, I love that series but um okay now i just want to ask specifically um a time to kill so do you remember how old were you when you read that book because me i watched the movie and it was it was hard to watch there's a couple scenes that are hard to watch but um how was it reading that book and how old were you i want to say it was around my early teen years mm -hmm. i believe it was might have been sophomore year junior year junior year i know but between junior year and senior year i read a ton in the summer yeah. So I can't remember if it was in that period or not. Um, it was definitely high school years, though, I want to say. I read The Client. I read A Time to Kill. I think I read The Pelican Brief. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know in high school, we actually watched um, the, the jury one with the court. I can't remember the name. Yeah, Runaway Jury. Runaway Jury. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we watched a movie of that. And then... I watched the time to kill, I think might have been in high school too, might have been outside of high school, but the it, movie so, the movie was tougher to me. I was gonna ask you that. How how would how did you feel, man? Like you read the book, so it was true to nature, it was true to form, right? Like what you read in the book is what you saw, what happened yeah. to the little girl, right? Yep. Like how was that for you watching that? Cause it's emotional. I'm pretty emotional when it comes to movies. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't so emotional when I would read it back in the day, but like now when I read stuff, I've actually found like some scenes reading it are emotional too. So I'm mm -hmm. pretty easy to tear up these days. So. Yeah. Join the club, man. Join the club. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the client, um, I was really impressed with that movie, man. I think it was Susan Sarandon and, and um, Brad Renfro. Brad Renfro? Was it Brad Renfro? Do you remember? Because Brad Renfro... I'm not sure. I don't... Committed suicide, man. 
I can't remember exactly if I watched the client movie or not. Oh, you read the book. I read the book. I'm trying to remember if I saw the movie. I want to say I did, but I don't remember certain scenes and stuff. Oh, that that was well done. They used to do some good movies back then, man. Those kind of suspense movies and things, anticipation. Okay, now we're in the middle of the podcast, bro. So I have um, a question for you. And it's a, it's a would you rather question. And it's going to be interesting because you're 26. So when, you, when I talk about going back, you're not going back too far, but let me know what you'd want to do. Would you rather visit your younger self and give them advice for the future? Or would you rather, rather visit your older self and have them give you advice for what's going on right now? I'd rather visit my older self, definitely, because, you know, I'm I'm a in the present kind of guy. Mm -hmm. Um, but I I don't like thinking about the past at all. I also don't like thinking about the future, but I would wanna know I would wanna get advice from my future self definitely to better prepare me for the future. Yeah. Because wow. mm -hmm. the past is already done, you know, and I wouldn't wanna I don't know. Like I feel like I I for myself I would be better off asking my future self than helping my past self do better mm -hmm. in like another timeline or something. Wow. I I love this question. It's so interesting. So that's two for two. So my guest, Leah, my first guest for season seven, she said the same thing, future self, but I get a mixed bag. All right. Now this next question, there's four things you have to answer and it's based on your younger self. This is where it's going to be interesting for me to hear. What would you tell your younger self about money? Uh, save it. Mm. When I think about all the stuff that I had growing up as a kid, that like you would get money yourself and you would spend it on stuff that you wanted. You know, in the moment, you you enjoy playing those games or whatnot, but. Now I would say, like, I don't, I don't play any of those things or whatnot. So one side of it is like, oh, well, I could have had all that money for other stuff now if I had saved it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's, you know, it's, I don't know. It's, it's a weird thing to say, I guess, to be like, oh, I wish I saved the money, but then I wouldn't have enjoyed those things. So, Right. Good point, man. But you're still young. So now, you know. Yeah, I always tell people, and, and we have these conversations, like, as long as you don't take money that serious, like, you know what I mean? There's more important things than money. But I always say money's important because this is how you live. You know what I mean? And when you're older, you want to live more free. So it's good if you have that nest egg, however you get it. You know what I mean? You monetize your channels. You start a business. Just have that that comfort zone. And then you can do what you want to do, man. When you're my age. <laughs> Next, Zach. And this is interesting because what you said before about girls. So what would you say, what would you tell your younger self about love? Um, I would say that at, when I was younger, I thought love was one thing. And now older, I know love is another thing. Mm. So I would say to my younger self that you think you love these girls, but you don't because you don't know them. And, you know, you should just not worry about it too much because it's high school. And okay. High school's not, it's not the movies, you know, you're not going to find someone in high school and then live with them for the rest of the time. So mm -hmm. it's, that's, that's, that's not often it does happen, but yeah, it's not often next. What would you tell your younger self about family? Um, Man, that's a good one. I would say, I don't know. Like, I kind of enjoyed all my time with family. I have a lot of cousins and stuff, and I enjoyed, you know, all the time that we had that I could get, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I would really have anything to say on family. Um, I haven't had anyone pass away 
so oh, far man. in my life that's been major in my life. No grandparents have passed away yet. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been very fortunate to have my grandparents as long as I have. And I spend time with them as like much as I can. I try to see my grandparents once a month. Yeah. Because they are getting up there, you know. So I would yeah. say to your question, I would say it's more of a telling myself currently about family is like I want I have all the stuff I want to do, but you know, the grandparents ain't gonna be around forever. Yeah. So right, so right. I I only had one grandmother that I knew and she lived in Barbados and I seen her maybe a handful of times in my life. She lived long. She lived to 106. Wow. Yeah. So Good we went her, to man. Yeah. So we went to her 100th birthday in Barbados. There was a big party, but it's the only grandmother that I that I knew. All right. Last one. What would you tell your younger self about friends? Oh, man. I would say you know, enjoy, enjoy just another like enjoy your time with them cuz now <clears throat> I know I don't really talk to any of them. Mm. You know, any of the friends I have in high school, I have more like online friends, you know, from my sim racing and stuff. Yeah. So I would say Yeah, I don't know. I don't really have an answer to that, I think, to be honest yeah. with you. I don't know I just... what I don't know what I would say. I would I don't know, maybe like, yeah, just value the time with them and stuff. That's, that's it. That's what I just enjoy them. Value the time, man. That's correct. Then there's no correct answer to it, but yeah, good one. All right. Now let's get into death craver. This is what I want to know about first. Yo, Zach, I want to know what inspired you to, to write this, this book, but also can you give a little synopsis about Death Craver. Okay, so when I was in my senior year of high school, I started daydreaming to, um, well, actually, let me backtrack a little bit. I would always, like, think about something to help me fall asleep at night. I can't, yeah. like, my mind's always racing. Racing, yeah. So I have, you know, I have a little anxiety, ADHD. That's why I'm like always like kind of looking around a little bit. Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. Um but so I would day I'll daydream to fall asleep. And early in my senior year, I would start thinking of um what you would call a fan fiction. So you would take a story that's its own thing, right? And you like put yourself in or you put like another fictional character in and you see like where the story goes. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that. Um, myself with uh, the TV show I mentioned to you, Hot Wheels Accelerators, the animated movie TV thing that okay. was for kids. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that, and then I thought, like, oh, what if I just like started writing this down? You know. So very early on, it was this like rough, kind of half fan fiction, half its own thing. Okay, and. I wrote like one book, which originally it was titled Inferno. So it was titled Inferno, which is the name of the team of uh, the teenagers. Right. So originally it was like Inferno. Ignition was the first book. Um, the second book was Dawn of Peril. And then I forget the name of the third book that I had. But so I got to like the third book. And then I wanted to go back and rewrite the first one before I um, wrote what was going to be my last one at the time. Okay. Because at this point, I had really gotten the story to its own point mm -hmm. with all the characters and the stuff I'd come up with. So at first, I was just going to like edit it. And then I was like, you know what? Like This thing needs its own overhaul. Okay. And when I did the overhaul that's when death craver started to come to be and i made it more so its own thing you know like the the first draft had mention of acceleracers in it like it was like a show in the universe and it's like oh what if i told you it was real so it was kind of like this weird like thing where it was like yeah i should like 
totally go away from this and just make it its own story. Mm -hmm. So then that's kind of how Death Craver started to form and it started to become its own thing as I really expanded because the first draft was only about 60,000 words. There really wasn't any description to it. It was like a very expansive outline. Okay. Say. Yeah. But I like made it more of its own story and stuff. And then, you know, and I worked with an editor and he told me that I should change. He had a lot of good suggestions for me. And then once I like looked at that stuff and I got, I got new ideas from that. And then that's the draft that is Death Craver now was written um, about two years ago. Yes, yes. So that's where, that's like the timeline of the writing. So I guess to your question, you were asking about like what inspired it and stuff. And it was, it was just like daydreaming. Like I just wanted to start writing down like what I was like thinking about, like fiction, you know, just like a story. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it to be a darker version of accelerators because accelerators was for kids it had it has the these dark elements and stuff and there's like a top secret team but there's you know there's no real there's like implied death but you know there's nothing yeah and it had it had some it has some really dark elements to it like one of the characters was doing like some kind of shady drug deal and he sold his brother out to save himself Mm -hmm. so and then like there's fights and stuff like the characters are punching each other this was for seven-year-old kids man they made this for seven-year-old kids <laughs> and they got they got these robots that were like out to like destroy you know the characters which you know, there's another word to kill them or whatever right right so it had a lot of these like dark undertones to it and i just wanted to like kind of take that to like the extreme like because i would watch um like i had watched death race i'd watch like the saw series oh so i really yeah i really wanted to take it to that dark place mm. you know so, so that's kind of how death craver came to be so do you ever get writer's block because it looks like imagination is a big thing for you um thinking of ideas and stuff, but you ever get that writer's block? Cause it looked like you had so many ideas in your head and you have to get this on paper or however you um, document it. But I would say it's, I have like an interesting case of writer's block. I think most people, I'm assuming most authors, they just have no ideas. Yeah. That's usually, I think what I think of when I hear about writer's block is they don't, they don't know what to write. Okay. I just have like a hurricane in my head mm -hmm. and I can't piece it together. Yeah, That's my it. writer's block. My yeah. writer's block's completely different. It's like, I don't know what to write because I have like 10 ideas swirling around in my brain. Mm -hmm. So I'll sit there and I'll have the document open mm -hmm. and I'll like, I'll start writing one thing and then I'm like, ah, like, I don't know. Like, and I like erase it and then like I write something else and it's tough. It's like, I, I usually will just sit there and think about something for like an hour. Mm -hmm. and you know you're just sitting at a staring at a screen for like an hour an hour goes by fast yeah. that's like the scary part the hour so goes right. by really quick when yeah. you're doing that and so you know i've tried to train myself to like just get up and walk away but i can never do it i like i need to i need mm -hmm. to figure it out and then also I'll, I'll i'll write something and then i'll go back and i'll read like the page or whatever mm -hmm. and it, it's usually fine it's like yeah. i was overthinking it for nothing yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because it seems like I have a creative brain too, right? And I and I know what you mean, Zach. So do you ever get that? I don't even know if you call it anxiety, but I've had it for when I did stand-up comedy and even when I'm writing things for work, I have all these ideas in my head and I can't get it down. I have to be in the right mindset to actually start writing because I'll just sit there and not do anything. And then I'll watch TV, I'll watch YouTube, like I'll go away because it's not coming out. But tell me, does this happen to you where you finally sit down and when you start, it's like you can't stop? Yeah, definitely. I'll definitely have, you know, for an example, like I'm writing book two 
Uh, tentative title for book two is Agent Zero, which he's a mysterious character shown a bit in the first book, Death Craver. Mm-hmm. And he'll have this bigger, he's going to have this way bigger role in this book. Um, so there's a lot of chapters. I have it all outlined. Like I have this big outline document with each chapter that goes over like most of what at the time was going to be each scene. And, you know, some stuff has changed. Um, but to the point, there are chapters where I can sit down and I can hammer them out. Mm-hmm. And then there's chapters that I'm a, li- a bit, a bit more meticulous with it because yeah. I'll have one thing. It's mostly, I guess, to a point I'm like all over the place, by the way. So. <laughs> no, don't worry. Right? Don't worry. Um, so the dialogue chapters, mm-hmm. dialogue chapters are by straight definition, a pain in the ass yeah. for me <laughs> Yeah, because I'll have it. I have like one thing in my outline that character A says this character B responds as such. And then character C inputs this because I have a lot of, I usually have like five characters in a conversation. Okay. And like sometimes it's like a lot it's easier when it's like two or three people Mm -hmm. but when i have five people all standing in a room it's Mm -hmm. like okay well i have to i have to i want to make sure that the people that are talking are the people that i want to be talking but once you get in the rhythm of writing and you let the flow go like they say just let the flow go and let it come out Mm -hmm. and then let the characters do their thing you know how they react so i've started doing that more so I'll have one character react and they're not even in the outline, mm-hmm. which, you know, the outline's just an outline. So it's not like a go by this or else kind of like document. Right. So that's when I get stuck mm-hmm. is I'll, I'll have someone say something that I, that just kind of like pops in my head as I'm running. And then that's when I like, I have to like, look and I'm like, Oh crap. Like now I'm going in a different direction here, which it's like, I just want to make sure that my overall direction stays the same. I don't want to like completely veer hard left. Right. But it, it, it is tricky because you want it to seem like they tell you that they, a lot of people will tell me, you know, you want it to be, you, you don't want to box the characters in. You want the characters to be themselves and mm-hmm. do what you would expect them to do, which, you know, I feel like most of the time they're doing what they should do. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like they are coming off hypocritical or anything. You know, I feel like I do a pretty good job with the development. So, but it I, is I, something, it is something I have to think about because I want them to seem genuine. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say that Zach, like character ve- development, because you want to grow that character in the direction that they're supposed to go in. And if you get that wrong, then it changes everything. So very important for that. Yeah, definitely. Um, And that's why I'm a bit, like the way I write, I write third person, um, get a third person limited. So you're allowed to go into a character's thoughts, one character's thoughts per chapter. I don't do it all the time. I did it a lot in my first, my first book, Death Craver. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to limit it a little bit in in the second one, um, but it is really useful to if I want to focus on a character and see how they're processing what they should do. You know, it's good to have the thoughts, their thoughts on the paper. Yeah. So I want to know now too about the journey in getting the book published. Is that a difficult process? Because you said you had an editor. But also, did you do the research for for writing too? Like, how did did it come natural, or did you research, or who do you talk to advice when it's um when when coming to writing a, a book? So, I kind of just did my own thing, mm-hmm. and I wrote it how I kind of wanted to write it. Okay. Um, you know, the advice came in when I talked to the editor. Mm-hmm. Um, so my editor Warren. He, he input a ton of good advice. So I did a editorial assessment first, which he reads through the whole document, you know, the whole draft manuscript, you can call mm-hmm. it manuscript. We can call it. Okay. So he reads through the manuscript 
and then like he makes like a couple of key points and tells you like oh if you want to do a development editing or copy editing but he gave me some basic tips that really helped me craft the final draft okay in a much better way while still keeping most of the story the way it was mm -hmm. so i'm sorry what was your question again i just started going and then i no, no. got the question <laughs> so you answered that part I, you you developed it on your own and you had um input from the editor but now the journey now how was that journey to getting it published because i think i know a couple of people that wrote books and you know there's a lot of back and forth and sometimes when you use real people you got to change names ask for permission and to get it out like how was that process for you so for me right i don't use any real names mm -hmm. of like no one's like there are some coincidences like i found out um one of the maids in the book she's never directly stated full name mm -hmm. but her first name samantha and she's yeah. referred to as Sam a lot. And then later in the book, she's referred to as Mrs. Bennington, mm -hmm. which I actually found out. Um, Samantha Bennington is a real person that was Chester Bennington's first wife. Okay. And I didn't even realize it until like a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, Dang. like, I'm like, that's why you put the copyright in the book. And yeah. it says, you know, none of these characters are influenced from real people or meant to be like real people. Because mm -hmm. you don't want, you know, you don't want them to say like, oh, well, the real Samantha Bennington doesn't act anything like this. Well, that's because that's not the real. Not that's not yeah. why I, how I wrote the character was off. You know, I, I don't know who she is like in person. Yeah. I'm sure she's a great person. Right. Yeah. But, like, I don't know who she is. So mm -hmm. that character was it's just a coincidence. You're going to have coincidences. I actually had a character. I have a character by the name of Shane Anderson. Mm -hmm. which took the first name from one person I know and then coincidentally took the last name from an, another good friend of mine. Yeah. And I didn't find out till later that his last name was Anderson. Um, but so there's actually, we had um, someone join a Discord server I'm in and his name is legitimately Shane Anderson. And I was like, this is so <laughs> weird, dude. I was like, I have a character in my book after you, man. <laughs> But that's why you put the copyright in because you don't, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, it's it's supposed to be like a fictional character. Now, obviously, right. you know, with um, brands, right? Mm -hmm. Brands are where things get tricky, right? I like to think that no one is upset about free advertising because mm -hmm. I'm not selling, like if I put in my book, like, monster energy right mm -hmm. i'm not selling cans of monster energy yeah i'm selling a book right and you know like i'm not going to use your brand as an advertising tactic mm -hmm. <clears throat> so obviously you have all the real cars in there you have ford you have nissan so you know that's really the only i would say that's the only brand names that i've got in there that i might have to worry about and then the music you know like the mention of music artists because oh, you know yeah. i have the playlist so yeah. that's why it's it's called the playlist i'm not selling anything mm -hmm. and then one thing i was told to do or one thing i did research before i published it was i had had lyrics mentioned at times mm -hmm. um and I had quoted them, mm -hmm. but I found that you need to get permission to put the lyrics in because mm -hmm. that's when you get into the territory of like a little bit of copyright infringement. Right. But if you just put the song title and the author mm -hmm. or the artist, you're fine. Oh, okay. That's what my research gleaned. I've, I've found, and I haven't gotten any emails and I mean, obviously, you know, I haven't sold, I am not like. I haven't gone crazy yet, right? Mm -hmm. But so that's one thing I'm I'm doing in the second book is I'm not mentioning 
artists or songs by name in the actual writing mm -hmm. they'll still be tied to like a chapter through my playlist mm -hmm. that's just like a thing for fun like having a playlist um but unlike the first book they won't be mentioned by name um but it's fine for them to be in there right as just the song and um the artist so back to the whole journey so I, I did the copy editing with my editor and then I changed a couple more things. So then at that point I had to make a decision. Um, when I had my, my previous draft, which was done in uh, early 2019, was it early 2018 actually? Mm -hmm. um, so back then I researched how to, get it published and i was emailing literary agents so if you want to get traditionally published you have to email a literary agent they have to take you up and then they they start shopping you to publishers and then you eventually you know you get your deal okay. and then they want right they want so much they want you know what not done now one thing i've realized in hindsight just to touch on it is that a lot of authors if they write a series Mm -hmm. They have two or three books already done. So then they can, they can go like book one, January, 2024, book two, August, 2024, book three, March, 2025. And then they start spacing them out because oh, okay. now they're writing. They have all the advance from the first three and mm -hmm. they're moving. And then, then, then that's how they get locked in. So I didn't really, I wasn't even thinking of that. I was just trying to get book one out. Right. So I realize now, like, I would have boxed myself into having to go, go, go on the second book if I wanted to, like, meet whatever expectations they wanted. So but this also, way was this way is better for you then, right? Right. But I also yeah. believe now that that's also why I wasn't maybe being picked up because um, you write a query letter and, you know, the query letter is just the first book, whatever, any awards you've gotten. And I'm like, you know, I was a nobody. I didn't do short stories or anything. A lot of people now, they have short story accolades and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that helps you get published. So back to 2021, when I was done with this new, this final draft, I thought, do I want to start looking people up again to query mm -hmm. or do I want to just self-publish this and get this thing out? Cause it's been a five year process at this point. Yeah. So I sat on it for like half a year before I like went through and did my final edits in early 2022. And then I sat on it for a couple more months. And then in, it was like June or July, I decided, all right, I want to get it out by the end of the year. I just want to get it out. Right. I don't I don't care about the money. I just want to get it out. I want people to start reading it. I want to get some feedback, see how it is, you know. Mm -hmm. Cuz I'd had my editor's feedback and he had given me good feedback and there was nothing really wrong with the story cuz I had been so OCD about it. Yeah. It was there was like some very small things, right? He's like, "Oh, like I don't know if the character should react like this or whatever." And I was like, "Ah, oh, well, like I look at that and I'm like, "Okay, well, you know, it's the character like, you know, whatever um but you know it's still in the bank right mm -hmm. so i decided to self-publish so at the point of self-publish you have to once you're done with the editing you start getting into this the this design okay so design is both the interior how it looks on the paper mm -hmm. and then you know cover artwork back artwork so i got to work with two really good people um their names are slipping from me right now but that's what i want to ask you about the cover art the the, yeah. the front oh man I, I love that i love the look of it i'm just trying to find you know i got him in my acknowledgments so i just want to get that pulled up so that i can give him a shout out too i think this is in here Okay, yep. So my the cover was done by uh Jonas Perez. He's mm -hmm. from uh I think it was Spain, I wanna say. Yeah. 
So I there's a website called Readsy, R E E D S Y. That's mm -hmm. how I met my editor Warren, and then that's how I met Jonas for the cover design. And then all, uh, Steve, all online, eh? All online. Yeah, all online. And then yeah. um Steve Kuhn did the interior formatting and he's over in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So he's West Coast. So I had it was such a weird thing when you would I would message the the team, you could say. Mm -hmm. Because Warren Warren's was Vancouver. So he's fellow Canadian oh. to you. Okay. So, yeah. so Warren's over on Vancouver Island. So I know he's three, four hours behind me, which is great because I can message him at 6 p.m. my time when I get home and he'll get back to me. Right. I can message Steve at 6 p.m. my time. He'll get back to me. Mm -hmm. Jonas, I got to wait 12 hours because he's <laughs> ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was like a cool, like a bit of a dynamic. But so it would be to the point where for, for Jonas, I would wake up and I would see his message. Okay. Because he would get back to me at 3 a.m. my time. Mm -hmm. But so I talked to Jonas. So now the cover, right, I had the idea for the cover, mm -hmm. like already. Like I knew what I wanted. Yeah. And, you know, it's not like, you know, it's not like 100% how I expected it to come out. Mm -hmm. But it still looks fantastic. Like I, I can't complain about it. Yeah. Like it's it's perfect for what, like. I wanted to convey as mm -hmm. the, as the book cover. And I'm, I've been debating on if I want the next few book covers to be a similar thing mm -hmm. because, um, agent zero to give a little context, he's one of 10 agents for this, uh, alien corporation called the Neovian agency of universal research. Mm hmm. And these guys wear custom helmets that are shaped after the head of an animal. Oof. So Agent Zero's helmet is shaped after the head of an English bulldog. Yeah. And it's got bloody teeth. And so, you know, Death Craver's helmet, right? It's black with the purple. Mm -hmm. So for, and you've got the purple and the black lighting going on on the cover. So for book two, I really would love to have the color schematic of, the uh, NAR agents, as I call them, as the acronym, acronym, abbreviation, acronym, N-A-U-R, -A -R. right? Yeah. Yeah, N-A-U-R. N-A-U-R. Okay. And then I pronounce it NAR, not NAR. Yeah. I, someone asked me once, NAR? And I was like, no, nah, they, they use silent. I don't count the U. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So the color scheme for NAR is white and red. So it's all white suit with like red visor eyes or whatever mm -hmm. so now since it's shaped after the head of an english bulldog in my mind i always envision it as um it's just like like two eye holes not like a full face visor mm -hmm. like a racing helmet right so you would have like an it would be an actual english bulldog head with the red visor eyes and like bloody teeth oh wow and then, so then the cover would be that helmet in like white and red going on in the background mm -hmm. and that's how i would hope i can get the book two cover to look yeah so, so wait do you want the same person to do it oh yeah i will definitely yeah. try to get jonas to do it because yeah. i feel like it would it would be consistent with his style that's, to see if he, if he could do it so so i i was talking to the designer uh i was talking to jonas and steve and then, you know, I was going through a bunch of stuff when uh, Steve would have me read through the um, the manuscript because he's putting it into a PDF now. So I have to double check, make sure everything copied over. Mm -hmm. And then he said, like, you know, mark it as you need to. So now one thing that happened when I was doing that is I found out through researching that a lot of stuff that I thought was going to come out in early 2021 didn't come out. Mm -hmm. Two things, two cars did not come out. Actually, three cars now I found out later. So, but wait, are these cars that were in the book? Car, you're saying cars, yeah. So, cars that are were written in the book in early 2021 that were either ended to. up, they ended up not coming out oh, or that their wow. names got changed. Oh, wow. So, so, I ended up and I found a bunch of smaller 
editing errors that I had made myself that I wanted to fix. So I ended up going through the whole thing again and made a bunch of changes in like a rush. And that actually, that pushed the publishing back from October to December. Mm -hmm. um, but so for a couple of examples, um, Nissan was originally going to produce their new sports cars, the 400Z. Yeah. And I had not found out that I hadn't checked because I figured they just released it as the 400C. For one, it got delayed. And then for two, they changed it to just the Z. Mm. So I had to change that. I found out Subaru. Subaru ended up not making an STI model for the year that I had the car in. So all I had to do there was change the year one year earlier. Okay. Yeah. Um, Hyundai ended up recently, after the book was published, they ended up saying there were rumors that they've canceled production on a car they were going to make. So, like, for a second edition, I might put concept at the end of that whenever it's mentioned. But it doesn't really matter too much to me because one argument i can kind of make is that um the book's in a different universe from ours mm -hmm. but that won't be an argument i can make until later in the story yo there's so many things that i i knew you had to be you gotta be meticulous you gotta understand that things that you put in the book something may happen it's like you're saying about the cars i didn't realize that there's so many little details that you have to um make sure that you got right it's like wow does yeah, that, wait going back to like your you know how you say you had anxiety and stuff like that did this play on you does it come up sometimes when things like this happen or you know how to control and hone hone your um, yeah. energy a different way do you know what i mean yeah it's kind of like a um i hope you don't mind me being blunt but it's pretty much like a oh shit moment yeah you know <laughs> you're like oh shit like i got to fix this so yeah. you know it yeah it's a lot of there was definitely like a lot of when i get anxious i get frustrated so it's, yeah. that's where the anger management came in right growing up mm -hmm. so i get frustrated so i'm like i'm mad as hell that i i'm like double now i'm like looking through the whole manuscript with every mention which the good thing is is with microsoft word and with adobe pdf yeah you can search by term and it, you'll pull up all the results oh yeah so it makes it Perfect. super easy to mark everything mm -hmm. um but yeah that was definitely something and then when i was you know going back to the music thing one thing i had a co-worker had told me like oh you know usually stephen king you know he gets permission to use certain lyrics and i was like i was like oh crap like i better go check make sure i'm not i don't have any lyrics in there <laughs> mentioned yeah. by name and i like looked through everything and i was like okay i just have songs mentioned and now at the time i didn't want to remove the mentions of the songs. Mm -hmm. I think I removed the mention of a few, but I kept a couple of key ones in there in the actual manuscript. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. Like I was like checking all the car. So then I'm checking every car. I'm like, I'm double checking the specifications and everything. Oh, wow. One, yeah. one thing that's a pain is car specifications mm -hmm. because you can go to car and driver and car and driver will say that they tested this car and the zero to 60 was 4.6. But mm -hmm. if you go to another site, it says it was 4.5. So it's like, well, which is it? Yeah. And my, I actually had a, I actually had a cousin of mine tell me after he's like, it doesn't matter too much mm -hmm. because people mod cars and you don't even have to say the car is modded because people will car. People will assume that it's modded. Okay. So that's wow. why I'm like, all right. Yeah. I'll, I'll keep that in thought. <laughs> Okay, so I remember when I, I got an advanced copy, you sent me a link and I got an advanced copy. So how was that process now? How did to get it on Amazon? Um, where else is the book uh found? Um, right now it's just on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Um I haven't looked into putting it up anywhere else yet. Okay. I might. Um, but right now I'm just kind of taking it simple with Amazon. Okay. Um, Google Play would be one thing I could look at. Um, the iTunes store would be, Apple store would be another one I could look at. Right. Those would be probably the next big two. Um, and then I know my website actually has like boxes in its builder that let me, like, if I put them on certain ones, I can put them up there. 
Mm -hmm. um you know so but so it's on amazon it can be rated it can be reviewed on amazon and then it can also be reviewed on goodreads which i was thankful to get set up on thanks to my editor because my Mm -hmm. editor is a a librarian for the website so okay yeah people can leave reviews on amazon and goodreads right now nice nice and it can get it can only be purchased through amazon yeah that's where that's where i got it from and currently you're working on the next one right you said yep yeah and now you learned so many things from this this death craver and now you're going to just bring it on to the to the to the new book and um and the same the graphics you're going to use the same person so i guess what i'm getting at is when this stuff starts to fall in line it gets a little easier and then it try to, it motivates you to just keep on going now and write series and just keep going dabble into different things right yeah definitely and you mm-hmm. know this right now my plan is to do three books uh, it might turn into four i don't know we'll see how much story there is but it might just be book two might be like a lot longer than book one is mm-hmm. which is fine i don't know if i'm going to be able to publish it as hardcover because right now Amazon's a bit restrictive with how many pages a hardcover can be because oh. they still they're still just doing the hardcover on the self publishers. Mm-hmm. So we'll see if I can even if it's just paperback, no big deal. But the second and the third book they might be really long. Yeah. Um, but I do have other ideas for stories, um, like on my phone and in the in the back of my mind. So to, to touch on that, um, so you know, Death Craver was inspired from you know, accelerators and like death rays and saw like the, mm-hmm. the main ideas from that. Right. Mm-hmm. I've had other ideas pop up through dreams. So I'll have a dream about something. Yeah. And then if I write it down, I'll, I'll like, I'll try to make like a brief story out of it. So I've, I've had like one idea. I had one dream where it was like, high school and i was like going through like a city and then i like went down this like this drain pipe kind of thing like Mm -hmm. this aqueduct almost okay and it emptied me out into like a town area and i'm like running around this like suburban area Mm -hmm. with the thought that there are cops looking for me Mm -hmm. and so when i woke up the idea i had was what if you had this dystopian society where you have so many kids in a high school get randomly selected quote randomly right and they're shoved into this survival situation where they have to run from the cops. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't give it away, bro. Wait, don't, don't do it. Don't man. give it away. You, you want me yo, to stop? You just, you're getting me going here, man. I, I was like into this, man, but don't give it away. Keep it to yourself right now. So am I still your idea? Nah, it's all right. <laughs> no, but I like, this is how good it is, Zach. If I, if I didn't like it, I'd be like, oh, let him talk. But after you were get to that part, I was like, no, 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 no. Let him keep it to himself, man. But yeah, so that's how like I've built some ideas on stuff like that. Nice. So. Nice. So now um I have one question for you now, um, that I asked my guest, and you're gonna actually choose a card, right? And then you're either gonna answer, let's see, Blue Jays. Or the Raptors? We'll go Blue Jays. Blue Jays. What is one of the most memorable moments of your life? I would say five... Five years ago, almost now, I got to go to my first NASCAR race with my cousin. Mm-hmm. So my cousin lived down in Richmond, Virginia. So there's a track down there. 
So we went and we went to both races, the Friday and the Saturday, and it was just, it was a great time. We got to walk around in the infield, take a bunch of pictures. Um, I didn't get to really, we didn't really talk to any of the drivers, but there was one driver who did like a little Q and a thing in the infield. So it was cool to like be that close to the, to the driver. He was like kind of one of my lesser favorites, not like a big favorite. Mm -hmm. Um, but so that was like pretty cool to just walk around the track and, enjoy the weekend nice and of course you love racing and everything so that's amazing sometimes i wonder if i interview someone again say i had you back on the podcast zach in like five years i wonder if you had the same question if it would change you probably have to do with writing or something too man but um or family who knows but i always wonder if i have someone again years later if that memorable moment would change but thanks for sharing that yo so let people know again even though you, I think you said it, let people know where they can find Death Craver. And I also want to know from you, do you like the promotional aspect of it too? Do you utilize your social media? Okay, yeah. so uh, you can find Death Craver on Amazon. It's D-E-A-T-H-K-R-A-V-E-R. -E um, and you could also go to my website at sackrogersbooks.com and there's like a quick link to the Amazon uh, my Amazon page. The promotional stuff I've found doesn't really work as you would hope it would. Mm. So two promotional things I've used so far is just the advertising campaign stuff. Okay. So I guess to respecify the advertising stuff doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. um, Amazon, they only charge you per click. So your ad can be show, shown up like thousands of times. They mm -hmm. only charge you when someone clicks on the ad. Okay. So that's one good thing about Amazon is they only charge you per ad click. Um, but people don't really click on your ad because they're showing it however many times, you know. Um, I think I, I get like, I would get like 10,000 impressions or 15,000 impressions, but you know, you might get only one or two clicks. Yeah. But the reason for that is I feel like due to the internet and, you know, social media ads and stuff, we've really tuned ourselves to tune out ads. Mm -hmm. Like you, you scroll on Facebook, you just scroll past the ad. You're you so don't right. even look at it, right? You don't yeah. even look at it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't work. Advertising doesn't work. I had this con I had a conversation for about an hour with uh, KT about this yeah. stuff. You know, conventional advertising does not work anymore. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's dead. Um, it's the same with NASCAR. Um, you've got these corporations sponsoring the cars. Um, there was a corporation, Nature's Bakery, a couple of years ago. They sponsored Danica Patrick. You know, Danica is mm -hmm. very marketable. Mm -hmm. Um they got like no return from their sponsorship. They got no increased business and they, they were not happy about it because they were promised, uh, supposedly they were promised a certain thing. I don't remember all the details, but yeah. So conventional advertising is dead. Um, and you know, I was only doing $5 limit, daily limit, $10 daily limit, but that's only if people click the ad through Amazon, right? Yeah. Now, so I, I've stopped that because I don't want to even spend the few dollars because people aren't really buying. Like I, if I look at my report, no one was ever buying from clicking the ad. Um, so Facebook advertising is a mm. little bit better in terms of you can be very specific about the demographic you advertise to. Okay. Yeah. Um, they have a bit more, a couple more tools that you can use. Um, but they, they charge you for the impressions. So mm -hmm. it's however much you want to spend a day. So, you know, I got a couple of followers and, and likes on my page doing some, doing a $10 limit for like a couple weeks, mm -hmm. but the money adds up fast. You know, it adds up fast <laughs> when you're doing that. Yeah, so I yeah. had, I lowered it to five and then I just stopped it because I was getting these people to like my Facebook page, but they weren't buying the book. Yeah. So it's like, well, 
it's good to have a couple more followers, I guess, but you know, it, it didn't really do anything. So I stopped doing that too. So there are promotional services like hello books and uh, some other stuff I need to look into. They're like lump sum payments and they put your book out on a promotional thing. But one thing they want you to do is they want you to set your book to free, which I'm fine doing that. Okay. Like I, Right. I've actually kind of gotten into the mindset now where it's like, it's not even about gaining the money. It's about building the fan base. Yeah. Right now it's all about, it's all about building the fan base. Mm -hmm. So one thing I've got to sit down and look into once I've got, you know, as we talked about before the show, I'm looking for work. Um, So once I have money again, one thing I need to do is I need to start looking into the promotional services for like hello books Goodreads can, you can do a book giveaway through Goodreads. So that's Mm -hmm. another thing I need to look into. I was talking to one of my aunts about it. Mm -hmm. I might go crazy to be honest with you. And I might just give away like a thousand copies. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because it's like, well, like I just want to build it. So, you know. Get it out there, man. Yeah. And then another thing you need too for books is reviews. I think it's a little different for stuff like drinks, you know, like I helped out the homie KT with you know i did a couple of youtube reviews for his drinks you know middle road energy um, shout middle out middle road energy yeah mm-hmm. shout out middle road energy go buy some i need to buy some more i haven't bought some in a while i need to yeah. i need to hook him up um but so reviews for for books are pretty good one thing i've thought of though with reviews is you don't want you don't want every review to be five stars okay Think about it right i get it if you if you look at like some big book right Mm -hmm. and you you read like the five star review and my editor wrote me a good one right he gave me a five star review which i'm appreciative of and he Mm -hmm. like spiced it all up you know i've got it like on my page in the description right yeah um and then one of my teachers wrote me a review from high school he gave me five stars Mm -hmm. I got one four-star review from a fellow author up in New Hampshire. I've been reading his book. Uh, he's got two books out. I've been, I read the first one and I've been going slow on the second one. Yeah. Uh, he writes science, he writes more fantasy than science fiction, but it's, mm-hmm. you know, science fiction fantasy. Um, so he wrote me a four-star review and he put in some good criticism and stuff. And it's like, I agree. Like, I think it's a four-star book, to be honest with you. I don't think it's a five-star book. Yeah, but I'm appreciative of whatever review you give me. Like, if someone wrote me a one star review, as long as they really tell me why they're giving me that one star review, like, okay, like if you're gonna be a real harsh critic, like, bring it, yeah, just yeah, you dish it out to me, you know. Yeah, I get but, it. You need to see that. You need to see that. Mm-hmm. But to the point, right? Like, you want, you really want to have, you want to be above a four, I think, mm-hmm. but you don't want to be right at a five. Like, I think probably a good range of belief is if you have like 30 reviews and you're from like a, you're at like a 4.2 to a 4.7. I think that's actually the goal. Now, I'm not saying people need to review that way, like on purpose, but yeah, I think like from a certain perspective, you want less than perfect. Yeah. You need a mixed bag and it needs to be honest and it needs to be um, good criticism. But um, because it's funny when you go certain places, if you get work done in your house, you go to the mechanic, they always say, hey, go to my site and give me give me five stars or give me 10 stars because they have a, a a score that they go by and all that stuff. Right. And I'm like, but if it wasn't a 10, I don't want to give you a 10. You got to be honest, because for that next person that goes there, it's like, yeah, you said it was 10. This is not the service I received. <laughs> but yeah, I actually my uh, my Kia, I have a Kia k5 and their customer service for the dealership i go to the guy the guy that i uh service me right he'll mm-hmm. tell me he's like hey man if you don't give me a 10 out of 10 on everything they're gonna talk to me they're yeah. gonna give me a hard time and it's like well <laughs> like yeah like i don't have any qualms with the service i was provided mm-hmm. but i think it's a little just a little crazy to ask for perfection on the yeah. review just like i don't even think they should treat their employees like that they want perfection. Yeah. Like you want it to be good, but you don't need it to be like "Mm, happy, happy world. Good. Yeah. yeah. Like you don't, (laughs) you don't need it to be like that. Yeah. Yo, 
I'm glad you're sharing everything. I learned a lot today. One thing I want to touch on before we go, like I'm going to do the donation with you, the balloon pop, but I want to touch on YouTube though. So before I started recording, we talked about YouTube because I really think you should get out there and uh, promote your your book and what you're thinking. You think I think you'd be good just talking to the camera about your book, but that's just me saying that. And um, all your ideas, I think there'd be a fan base there and you can draw them in, you know, to your other channels, Facebook, Instagram. But um, tell me about the YouTube. Oh, uh, yeah. So my YouTube channel is called Bulldog Speed. Mm -hmm. So it's Bulldog and then SP33D. So I do a lot of commentary over video game racing. Okay, yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, the homie KT hooks me up with that. Uh, he uses a alias. So, um, but yeah, we have a ton of fun and it's all NASCAR stuff. So I've been doing that for 10 years. Holy cow, 10 years. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a hobby. So I'm not making money from it. I just I do it for fun. People can sign up for it and you can really um tune the cars to drive a certain way and be like some people can be faster than others based on how long they've been signing up for and stuff like that. So it's a lot of fun. There's a good community based around it. A lot of people do it. They mm -hmm. call it um we call it offline leagues because mm -hmm. we're it's just the computer that is um running the cars around the track yeah cool man send me that after and if you did um want to go on youtube it's like you'd have to start a new channel because you know the mistake i made well i don't it's not a mistake though because to be monetized with youtube you have to have over a thousand subscribers and i have that but i built it from my wife and i's cake business and then i just changed everything changed the name now it's star scorpio and stuff like that but um, it's just funny that I have cakes on the channel, but I put a lot of them private. Mm -hmm. And then now it's mostly just me and the comedy stuff and the real talk. But it's like you don't want to mix the two. You know what I mean? Yeah, I would probably start a new channel as much as I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I have like a thousand videos on this channel. And it's oh, like, wow. Oh. And I still like doing the stuff too. So, you know, I, mm -hmm. wouldn't, I probably wouldn't want to mix it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Zach, time for the balloon pop, brother. So this season, I have three balloons. And the charities in the balloons are Kawartha Lakes Animal Wellness Society, the Fundraiser Warriors, and Make-A-Wish Foundation. Which one do you want me to pop? Um... Which one's the, the, you want me to go by name or just whatever balloon you're holding? No, the right, the middle, or the, my left? Um, let's go with the right. I'm right-handed, so. The right. The little guy. Look at this little guy here. Let's see. <laughs> it didn't even pop. <laughs> oh, it just started. <laughs> Seven seasons. <laughs> This is the first time that happened, and it's with Zach. Okay. Season 7, Episode 2. The charity that Star Scorpio will be donating to is, oh, my favorite little boys. You can't see it, though. The Fundraiser Warriors. Oh, these, these little right. boys are amazing. Raising money for good things. All right, Zach, anything you want to say to the people before we sign off? Yeah, just again, you know, uh, want to thank you for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. First time doing a podcast. I'd love to do more podcasts with people. I think it'd be a lot of fun just to talk about the book, different ways, different people. Mm -hmm. um, a shout out KT, you know, Middle Road Energy. Kevin you Touch. Your hook yep. up. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, my book links again, you know, sackrogersbooks.com. All my social media links are on there. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram good reads and then of course amazon where you can get death craver it's out now and uh yeah be on the lookout i guess for some giveaways of course once i finally get rolling on that and yeah you know i just i guess i'll you know I'll shout out my dad thank my dad for letting me live with him um cheap rent you know <laughs> gotta love it you, gotta um, love it. you know yeah. gotta thank my mom and my stepdad you know, all my grandparents and everything. Just, 
I've had, you know, very grateful for the upbringing I've had. Nice. And, uh, nice. As always, I like to shout out my microphone <laughs> and my headset because I wouldn't be able to have the podcast without them. And the computer, you know, my monitor, all that good stuff. This I like can of, the can of Red Bull I've been sipping at. They don't need a shout out really, but. <laughs> Zach, you you just did your own teaser. I like what you just did there. This is going to be in the teaser. So, Zach, thanks for coming out today. I really appreciate it. But tell them that your IG handle, though. I don't think you said your IG. Uh, it should be the same. I think I made everything the same. I want to say I did. Okay, no. So, my Instagram handle is uh, Zachary A. Rogers 97 Perfect. All right. This is Real Talk with Star Scorpio, season seven with Zach, and we out. <laughs>